Hi guys, we're going to go ahead and start doing inference with means now. We've just finished our inference with proportions review and now we're going to do our inference with means. So um, on this first part, what we're going to do is review um, means, population, sampling distribution, and their notation. Okay, And then talk about that thing we need to know the name of, the central limit theorem, and what that says. And then we'll go and talk about T distributions, why we use those with means, and because you need to make sure you know that, and then talk about the one interval, um, one mean interval in test, their conclusions, and their assumptions. Okay, so let's get started on that. All right, so first things first is that, um, you know, when we have the population, then we're just talking about individual pieces of data. Okay, so if here we're talking about this population of, uh, here of about individual people's times to um, run a mile or whatever. Okay, so here is our population notation. And for means, unlike, pop unlike proportions, you do have this parent population distribution. So we do have all of these individual times, okay, that we have here, and they have a shape, all right? Um, and so we remember also that um, if with this, if we know that this is normally distributed, then we have the right to be able to say, hey, what's the probability that you get, uh, or what proportion of people individual people have this much time or longer to run a mile. Okay? All right. Now, and so that's what this would look like if, say, we had the population. Okay? Um, but when you have, when you um, then take samples, okay, remember when we would have this little app, and so say that I took, here's two I just took two individuals, averaged those together, and dropped that down. So that first X blue you see there is an X bar from two. Okay, then it animated taking 25. Okay, we're going to pretend like it's 30 because we know 30 is that magic large enough number. But it took that and it took all of those 25 randomly selected ones Average them, got an X bar, and dropped it down. And then that's what I have down here in this blue down below. So here's two again, and drop down that X bar. Here comes the next 25. We're going to take those randomly selected ones, average them together, and drop that down to that bottom, and there's that X bar. Okay? So I'm going to speed this up and do it a whole bunch of times, and there we go. So again, this is where we kind of developed that understanding that what you see here on the top is the population, okay? But then this first blue item, that is a sampling distribution made up of samples of size 2, okay? And then that bottom one is a sampling distribution made up of samples of size, in this case they were size 25, okay? So we're, we talked about how the centers of those are the same, that's an important quality, and we talked about how um, the standard deviation, of course, is smaller as your sample size goes up, okay? All right, so that's what this is demonstrating. So if we were to describe the distribution for a sampling distribution, of course, we would want to say it's shape. Um, you're probably not going to be talking about outliers unless they're giving you specific data that might have outliers. Okay, that center, that mean of those X bars, okay, that center of those X bars is going to, the all, all of these little X bars is going to center around the mean of that population. So they'll all have the same center. So that's that there. <clears throat> but then we know it gets less varied as n goes up because it's divided by the square root of n. Okay. So there was our notation so that we talked about. Remember here that so x bar, okay, so that's an x bar, is a those sample means. This 
mu of x bars. That's the center of all of those samples. Okay, and then there's our standard deviation of the x bars, which we know by formula is that standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. Okay, now, now we need to talk about how all of this plays into the shape. Okay, so it's very important, and this is where central limit theorem comes in. So, first of all, what we identified over here on this page is that if your population is normal, then even a small sample, a sample of size 2, still going to produce a normal or approximately normal sampling distribution. Okay, um, but what we find over here, and this is what drives so much uh, of statistics, is that what happens if that population is not approximately normal? You know, it might be uniform, or it could be skewed, or something else, okay? Then let's take a look and see what happens, okay? Let's say we have small samples. We only drop down two items, average those, and drop, and we randomly select two, average them, drop them down, and get an X bar, okay? So look, you can see that this uniform distribution um, and this skewed, now it gets better, okay? It's less skewed, but it's still skewed, okay? And so on and so forth. So when the small sample drops down, then it's still a problem. But the magic happens when if n is large enough, then it doesn't matter. The shape of the population, the sampling distribution's about normal, okay? So the sampling distribution's going to be approximately normal regardless of the shape of the population. That's the very important thing that the central limit theorem is telling us, and that's working for means technically only because proportions don't have a population shape. All right, so that's where that comes into place. Central limit theorems about the shape of the population and the sampling distribution. All right, now let's talk about what happens whenever we are going to start running these tests and do this inference. What we found was that, and so here are the key concepts that we've talked about as to why we have to have a what's called a T distribution instead of the perfect normal Z distribution with the normal model, okay? So what we have happening here, here is the reason, okay? So important thing number one, and like the reason that T distributions are used is because we do not have the population's standard deviation. Okay, I'm, I'm going to run a test based on what you tell me your claim is, and then I'm going to take a sample, and I'll get the standard deviation of that sample. See, I'll be able to get that S of X, that standard deviation of the sample, but I won't be able to, I will not be knowing that standard deviation of the population Okay, and so we know Mr. T says, I pity the fool who doesn't have the population standard deviation, doesn't have this population standard deviation. Okay, you just have the sample, so then you're going to have to deal with Mr. T, a T test, or a T interval. Okay, now we know that number two says these T distributions are more varied because that standard deviation we are using is just the sample one, which may or may not be exactly right. Okay, all right, and as the sample size gets larger, as n gets bigger, then your t distributions get closer to the normal model. Okay, and we can see that from this picture here. See, uh, t distributions, if they're smaller than n, you know, we have got that. If they're closer to 30 or getting closer to, they're getting bigger, they're getting closer to this standard normal model. Okay, all right, 
so let's see. Since every number four says every t distribution has its own shape. And so every t distribution has its own probability values. Remember how in our calculator, it kind of takes our calculator a little bit longer to process the values because it has to go look up that particular curve, okay, and then compute off of that. So therefore, it's necessary that you state what t distribution is used to compute those probabilities. And we say that by defining their degrees of freedom. Okay, and for one sample um, intervals and tests, that degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Okay, we know that. Um, but for two samples, that's much more complex formula, which we're not expected to be able to compute. Um, our calculator gives that to us. Okay, so we just write that down from what our calculator gives us. Alrighty then, so let's get into it. So we've just recently come from... Um, doing this uh, problems with one proportions, um, intervals and tests. So hopefully this is going to go a bit faster, okay, than the initial one with the one proportion since we've kind of already talked about it. So here we go. All right, confidence interval formula right there. In general, the statistic, the sample results is an X bar because it's a mean, plus or minus. The critical value is a T star now, not a Z star because it's T distributions. And then this standard deviation of samples, the standard error of the statistic is that S of X over square root of N. Remember in proportions, it was that square root of P hat, one minus P hat over N. Okay, that was that standard deviation for proportions. All right, so the same ideas about what we have going on with our formulas and everything. Um, we've in this point estimate and our margin of error. So our margin of error is this X bar plus T star. You know, the margin of error is this part behind the plus minus. So our upper bound is going to be at the X bar plus the margin of error. <clears throat> and our lower bound is going to be that X bar minus. Okay. And do keep in mind that for our intervals, we have this situation where our X bar, you know, is going to be right in the middle of an interval. So if you have those numbers, then you could technically compute and figure out what the X bar is right there in the middle, okay, and then see how, what the value of each one, of how wide those margins of error are. Okie dokie. I think that's all for that page. And so let's go on to the next. So, uh, so this was that computing of that critical value. You need to find the critical value. While you may use the confidence level, the confidence level is what's in the middle. You inverse T of one tail. Inverse T of one tail. So inverse T of that one tail will get you that lower critical value. You know because of symmetry, you also have the upper one. Okie dokie. So we could do it by hand. We could also do our calculator commands. We have our T interval. Now, one thing to keep in mind when we do this with our calculator, okay? So uh, what happens is when we do this with our calculator for means, then we've got this tab right here up at the top, which is giving us options for how data is inputted. So if you have been given the individual pieces of data, then you would just go put it in the list and you would use this data tab right here. Okay. But if they give you those actual summary statistics, if they give you that X bar and that S of X, okay, then you're going to be filling that in there. All right, and you've got your, um, crit, your confidence level for doing an interval, because remember our interval is that estimate, that plausible range of values. So here's what the interpretations might look like. And I have this an interval interpretation, okay, and um, but then you also need to know how to interpret the confidence level. So we'll talk about those two differences, um, especially this year in 2020, 
when we're just going to have that one 45 minute test with two free response questions a lot of I think a lot of the way you're going to show in um, your knowledge of statistics is not by the computing but on your interpretation of the and the conclusions that you can draw from the data because that's going to be an easier thing that you can write out and state and then um, in your own words and such okay so here we go confidence interval I am 90% confident that the true average time that it takes people to stop the timer when they are trying to stop it at exactly five seconds is between 4.86 and 5.12 seconds. Okay, remember we had done the lab where you did a bunch of um, timers on your phone trying to stop it at exactly five seconds. Okay, now confidence level, however. Okay, let's recall that's whenever you have all of those intervals, you know, you have all of those, the confidence level comes from all those intervals, and what you're going to say is the Smelly Cat song, how many, how many, and what size interval, how many, how many, contain the true mean. So in this case, about 90% of them. Okay, of all of those 90% confidence intervals will contain that true average of people who stop the time, uh, people, the average time that people stop the timer when they are trying to stop it at exactly five seconds. Okay, about 90% of all of those intervals will contain the true average time people are trying to get when they try to stop it at five minutes. Um, Notice that this confidence level definition and, and phrase does not even have the numbers for the interval in it, okay? So that's one thing that's common. People want to put these numbers of 4.86 to 5.12 in their confidence level explanation, and it's not, okay? All right, moving on. Test. If you are computing that test by hand, then you are doing this t-score where you have your x-bar minus the mean of x-bars over the standard deviation of x-bars. And then, of course, this standard deviation of x-bars is that s of x over square root of n. Okay? Now, one thing that is different um, to note, once you get that t-score, and you want to do then your tail, and you want to calculate the area either from that t-score to infinity or that negative infinity to that t-score or however it is that you're wanting to do that, don't forget that when you put this into your TCDF in the calculator, you must include the D, F, T, 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 not Z. Okay, because you must include that df because that is telling the reader which t distribution the calculation was done on. So that's important. All right, moving on. Um, I did want to mention that if you were doing it by hand, let's let's just look at that real quick. If you were doing it by hand, then when you do your tcdf from that t to infinity or whatever, that is one tail. So keep that in mind that if you um, were doing the, um, it was a two-tailed HA, two-tailed alternative of not equal to, then you would have to take that area and multiply it by two to get the total p-value. Okay. All right. Just a reminder of that. But if you did it in the calculator with the t-test, then it actually will do that computing of the two tails for you automatically. Okay, you would put in here the the hypothesized um, mean, you know, five. We think the average is going to be around five. Okay, and then you would put in what your sample is and how far away you are and that kind of thing. Okay, so that's how you could do that in the calculator. So in summary, we'll do the conclusions. We know that if the p-value is low, you reject HO. So if I reject HO, then I got HO, and I am rejecting it. So therefore, my evidence supports HA. Okay? Okay.
Um, which, you know what, let's just talk about that. Let's just jump down here to down here, this interval connection. So if you are rejecting HO and going with that you have evidence to support HA, then what would happen is um, your interval would be entirely, if you had an interval, okay, your interval would be entirely below the HO or entirely above the HO, okay? So you, you wouldn't have HO in that interval, okay? And that's what this is saying down here when we're talking about making that connection. HO would not be in that interval. Okay, let's go with the other one. What happens if that p-value is not low? Then you don't reject HO. HO, you cannot say HO is true. You cannot say you have evidence to accept HO. You cannot say evidence that a, a, to support HO. You can't, evidence is not about HO. The evidence statement is only referring to if you have evidence of HA. Okay, no evidence for this HO. You just aren't, you don't have enough um, evidence to reject it or whatever. Okay, so you don't have evidence. You can never have evidence of HO. All right, so let's look at this interval connection. If we are not rejecting HO, I'm not saying HO is true. I'm just going to like let it stay. I'm going to just put a dotted circle around it because I'm going to let it continue to stay. I didn't have enough evidence to reject it. Okay, then what we would find if we were to make an interval is that that interval would be uh, made as an estimate and it would have had HO in it. Okay, so that connection is there that if you don't reject HO, then when you make that interval, you're probably going to have HO in that interval somewhere. Okay, so just make sure you got that connection down. Um, real quickly, um, the the assumptions are um, the same for our random, okay? We know that that's randomly selected if it's a, a study, that you're just selecting the subjects. But remember, if it's experiment, then you're randomly assigning them to the treatment group, okay? Independent, N is less than 10% of the population. Use context. But let's talk that large enough, okay? When we did that proportions, we had at least 10 successes and at least 10 fa failures. But large enough is tricky because it all depends. Mean or proportion, they have different rules. So for means, it has to be greater than or equal to 30. And if so, then you say, because of the central limit theorem, approximately normal model applies. Okay, but I went ahead and I put some notes in here. What happens if the sample size is not large enough? then you have options, okay? Here's your possible options. Option number one is the easiest, and we would say you would go back and reread the problem to see if it is stated that the population is approximately normal. And if so, then you would respond like this, large enough. It is not large enough. However, it is stated that the population is approximately normal, therefore, the approximately normal model applies. Okay? All right, but what if that doesn't happen? Well, then let's look at what the next thing is. If the problem does not indicate the population is approximately normal, hopefully you have been given the individual pieces of data so that you can then make yourself a dot plot Make sure that you label that dot plot, okay? And so then what you're saying is you're going to plot it and show, hopefully, it'll distribute, the data will distribute and be sun. Somewhat symmetric, unimodal, have no outliers or unusual features. And the, here's why. Because that criteria is used to determine that it is plausible and there is not data to dispute the possibility that the population could be approximately normal. Okay, You don't have something funky enough to mess with that possibility.
Okay, so then you're going to say, okay, approximately normal model applies. Again, remember that again on problems, unless they indicate to you and they say something like, um, a test is not appropriate, why? Okay, if that's what they ask you, then you're going to go examine the conditions and see why might it not be appropriate to run a test. Otherwise, you're going to go with saying that the conditions are met, you could always, if you're not comfortable doing that, you could say, hmm, these does, does not look exactly somewhat symmetric, but I'm going to go with it and, uh, and, go, and go on from there. All right. So that is then the end of our Inference with Means Review Video 1. We talked about those population and sampling distribution um, shapes and, and um and notations again and that really important central limit theorem so that we know that if n is large enough the sampling distribution is approximately normal that why you have that t distribution instead of the normal it's because I pity the fool who doesn't have the population standard deviation we talked about the one mean interval in test their conclusions and those assumptions okay all right, so that is the end of our Inference with Means review video one.